point is I've risked no exclusive list because it's a pure soap. And there's nothing safer to clean all my fine washables. I've tried others, but I've been ruined for Niagara Snow. I'll take it. And I'll take it back. Pure soap, Ivory Snow. Nothing safer for fine washables. Fetch us our favorite. At once, Majesty. But remember, no trickery. Me? Uh. Oh. <laughs> but remember, no trickery. Imperial margarine. Flavor fit for a king. Well, I, I liked it over there. My kids had me growing up. Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. Union news is off the top this morning, and there's one story we simply must get to the bottom of. It looks as if the letter carriers of Canada have got a very unusual deal. When they go on vacation, it says, the relatives are going to get the first uh, chance at the summer vacation jobs. We'll have a letter carrier's union official on later in the program. But first, what about Bennett's wage controls? What about his 10% law? The major unions are looking at this very statistically and kind of ignoring the situation. And the case for BCGEU quite simply is this, statistically. It's the case for a catch-up. And these are the actual wage levels just now of ICBC, QP, the teachers, and BCGEU are way behind. For this this morning and for union tactics and decision, we have Jack Adams, who is the executive assistant to the president of the BCGEU. On a totally different sphere this morning, we have the moderator of the United Church of Canada, Lois Wilson, done a fair amount of world traveling, will tell us what she thinks, bad or good, of the fiber, morally, socially, ethically, of this country today. And an NDP MLA for Skinner, the indomitable Frank Howard. First after the break, however, the BCGEU and their catch-up with Jack Adams. Premier Bennett has announced his intentions to pass a law controlling wages in the public sector in British Columbia by a maximum 10% plus or minus 2 plus 2% 2 productivity where and if applicable. The key union involved in the challenge to Bennett's law or Bennett's challenge to them is the British Columbia Government Employees Union. And here this morning is Jack Adams, executive assistant to John Fryer. Now, first of all, for the record, Jack, I want to look at that uh, little graphic once again. It's up there. And I want you to tell me, is that an accurate representation of wages as they are at this moment? Yes, that's an accurate representation of wage increases from 79 to 82. So therefore, the BCGEU is substantially behind? Substantially. Now, how can you possibly catch up? What kind of an increase would you need to catch up? We feel that uh, our members have lost approximately 13.2% over the last three years due to inflation alone. Plus, we're, they're going to need protection for the, uh, for the oncoming uh, 
duration of the contract, whatever it is. Give me a ballpark figure. I'm not uh, unless you've made a firm, concrete plan for your demands for collective bargaining. We would probably need something in excess of 20 percent in the first year. 20 percent minimum in the first year. In the first year. What is your official position on Bennett's firm statement that he will introduce legislation restricting your increase to 10 percent plus or minus two and two? Well, we intend to ignore the Premier's uh, program. We're going to go to the bargaining table, we're going to negotiate hard, and we intend to get a settlement that's fair and equitable and that, uh, that will be acceptable to our membership. You're suggesting, therefore, that under this uh, threat or promise of Bennett's action, that you are prepared to negotiate in what you can still call free collective bargaining? We're going to continue on with free collective bargaining until such time as uh, we see something tangible that's going to change that, and uh, then we'll deal with that at the time. But we intend to bargain. How are you going to deal with... Well, uh, that's not fair, but first of all, Peck, Ed Peck, the new CSP boss, will have power to roll back. Do you anticipate you might go through negotiating with a government body which has said 12% is the maximum expenditure on any increase? Well, in our union, Jack, the members make the, the decisions, the basic decisions. If, in fact, we, uh, we negotiate an acceptable agreement that's ratified by our membership and it's rolled back, at that time we'll take it back to the membership we'll, uh, and they'll make the decision as to what we'll do from then on. But with this legislation over your head, is this not just a kind of form of tribal dancing, Gandhi dancing? No, we think not. Uh, uh, governments have had second thoughts in the past, uh, including uh, governments in British Columbia. We can recall that uh, not too long ago they were going to introduce legislation that would have substantially reduced the pensions of uh, our retired members, and they changed their minds after some consultation. Mm -hmm. Now, can I expect the, the usual... Uh, trade union mass demonstrations of thousands of irate BC GEU people on the steps of the legislature when the session, and he hasn't announced a date yet, starts sometime in March? No, we consider this to be a collective bargaining issue and uh, we're not going to uh, allow it to be made into, a, uh, to be used as a political football. It's not the intention of the BC GEU to have uh, the, the livelihood of our members used as a as a political ploy or a political football in the province of British Columbia this year. In other words, you're not going to be part of any common front harassing, invading the legislature or any of that kind of thing? There are no in we have no intention of doing that. Uh, I'm sure the BC Federation of Labor has no intention of doing that. And you're going in, you think that you can collectively bar bargain collectively under the threat of this law? We're going to bargain collectively under this law or this so-called law that's coming. Well, Van der Zam is out in front again this morning and he says what many social credit and other people think. You, the BCGEU, are very lucky to be employed in government. You have the security of employment and to be getting any pay increase at all, implied the 10%, when other people are taking reductions. Now, a lot of people agree with that, don't they? I'm sure they do. Will there not be pressure on you from uh, industrial unions and the outside squeeze, like the IWA, who are facing disaster with a 13% increase coming up this year, for them to say, look, 10% is enough for the BCGEU when our firms are going belly up? No, uh, just the reverse. I, I am sure the IWA, like every other uh, legitimate trade union in the province of British Columbia, believes that the, uh, the principle of free collective bargaining must be maintained and that we and uh, every other union, and, and I'm sure we will get support from the IWA and all the other affiliates of the BC Federation of Labor in our, uh, if we have a battle this summer. So therefore, the position of the executive U union, succinctly put, is what? We're going to the table. We're going to press what we consider to be our legitimate demands. We're either going to get a fair settlement or there will be a dispute in the province of British Columbia in the public service in August or September of this year. Now, give me the timing. When did you start negotiations? We start negotiations about the middle of May. Middle of May. When did your contract expire? 31st of July. After that, what position, what uh, timing would you need for a strike? If you come to a deadlock, as seems almost to is inevitable on the 31st of July. Shortly in, into August. Right, 72 hours after that. 72 hours after that, we could be in legal position to strike. There's nothing in the proposed bill which prevents you from striking? Not that we're aware of. You are prepared to strike if you get, don't get co collective bargaining agreements satisfactory to your members? Yes, we, we are going to go to the table with under the laws of the province of British Columbia, which give us the right to withdraw service if our membership are not satisfied with whatever the proposed settlement is. You need 20% and they're giving you a maximum, broadly speaking, of 10. I'm saying that we need a minimum of 20% to start off, just to get back to, uh, 
to uh, to where our members uh, were before this uh, before this that right away means, inflation. Does that started. not mean, Jack, therefore the bargaining is a total waste of time, although you'll go through the motions? Absolutely not. One broad question. You concede that the province of British Columbia is in financial trouble at the moment? Yes. Are you not prepared to make any sacrifice uh, because you are public sector employees who are not out in the cold climate of competition, but paid by the taxpayers? Well, I think there, you're asking two questions there, Jack. The answer to the first one is our members have already made the sacrifice. They've shown restraint for a period of three years. They've had a contract since 79 to 82 of 8% a year, which is a total of 24%. As your, uh, graph. As your graph shows. Your graph. Our graph shows. Many other uh, organizations in the province of British Columbia who receive their funding from the same source have received much more. I might also point out that the Premier had told us that the revenues of this province had been declining for two years. It's unique, or I think it's significant, that he, uh, he only brings in controls prior to us going into bargaining. He didn't mention this problem when he was giving out 20% uh, in each of two years to doctors or many other settlements, or raising the, uh, the income of uh, the legislature to some, uh, by some 40% during the same period Oh, he of time. does say he's going to roll that back. They're overpaid anyway. Well, right. will he roll it back to 1979? Uh, but he's now faced with the HEU, whose contract has expired, yours, which is expiring. The nurses who want 20%. The Hospital Health Sciences Association want a big catch-up clause. He's up against the wall for money. Well, he says he's up against the wall for money, but as I said, it's, uh, it's interesting that none of this has come out until, uh, until two or three public service unions are going up into bargaining. Uh, why didn't he... Uh, why did he take this into account if his revenues were dropping before he made the increases or for the legislature and some of the others? You tell me why he's done this now. Why do you think he's done this now? His big uh, province-wide speech on BCTV saying uh, consumer restraint, 12% maximum and 10% wages. Why did he do it? His primary purpose? Yes. To avoid his obligations as an employer at the bargaining table with the BC Government Employees Union. Would you not agree with me that his primary, another primary purpose might well be to create a confrontation with the well-paid, secure members of the BCGEU to call an election? Well, if, he's, if that's his purpose, and it may be, then it would be extremely cynical, and I don't think the people of this province will buy that kind of cynicism from governments anymore. So the BCGEU is now set to go into the normal bargaining process. We'll do it legitimately, and if you don't get what you want, you'll strike. Absolutely. My thanks to Jack Adams, Executive Assistant to President of the BCGEU. It's going to be a long, uh, hot uh, summer in British Columbia. Next, Lois Wilson, the moderator of the United Church of Canada. In the country that that is something. Do it. Well, I'm surprised that you even tried. And when I go, there's nobody to take my bloody oh, place. Dear, dear. <laughs> yeah. I wish I'd put my son into it. Yeah? Did you upset? Dr. Muchmore, Dr. McClure, and then a culture shock for me. <laughs> the Right Reverend Lois Wilson, moderator of the United Church of Canada. Coming close to the end of your term. Yes, I'll, uh, the end of the term is this August. Now, what do I call you? The Right Reverend? Whatever you like. No, no, don't talk. Can't call you Lois. Call me Lois or Dr. Wilson, whichever Dr. you're Dr. Wilson. With. That's what I don't really care. Um, came off just rather a heavy interview about trade union matters here. Are you, as the moderator of the United Church of Canada, prepared to take a broad look at this place and tell me, this country, and tell me what you think of the fabric of the country, what you think of mm -hmm. the economy of the country? Are you concerned? Yeah, I am, and I think my church is about many things. One is about the whole breakdown of what's happening in uh, personal relationships. I mean, the divorce rate, the suicides, the alcoholism, that performance in which uh, so many people have, uh, there's been a lot of, of alienation. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, is the economy, which is very much linked, I think, to the kind of world in which we live and the rising expectations we have here. Uh, for example, one of the questions I always raise with union leaders when I meet with them, and I do on occasion. You meet with union leaders? Oh, yes. Church is in touch with reality? <laughs> we hope so. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, you know, what are they prepared to do in terms of world development, for example? Uh, uh, you mean how much money are they prepared to give? That's right. 
Do they give any money? Well, uh, it varies. I mean, all, you know, you can't say, make a blanket statement about unions because they differ. But, but they you, are an important part of our economy. But would you also think of going to the banks with their undoubtedly obscene <laughs> profits and what saying... What do you think we do on Tuesdays? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do meet with the banks. I've met with many of the bankers of Canada to talk about that very thing. And you find them helpful? Well, we, let's say we have a very interesting exchange and dialogue going on. We're critical. We, and at one time you were very critical of the involvement of the banks with their investments in places like South Africa. Well, we what, still are. And what do you say of these uh, established financial institutions who, whose only concern is, is my buck secure and can I make money and I don't care what the regime does? Well, uh, one of the things that the church has come to in the last, what, 30 years is the understanding that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord not only of our personal lives but also of our money, mm -hmm. which includes our foreign investments, our bank loans, particularly to countries which, uh, which have a, a repressive regime. Like? Well, South Africa, which is unique, I think, in the world in one sense. So uh, one of the actions of my own church is to, uh, is to really transfer accounts out of particular banks until they make a public policy statement. Have you been doing that with yes, the United Church of Canada's yes, money? Yes, we have. Do you have a bank which you regard as clean, the way you, where you put well, your money? Well, there are no banks clean. Nothing is clean in this world, not either you nor me. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a way, it's a symbol, if you like, it's a way of expressing our dis-ease with the economic support of that apartheid regime. Mm -hmm. So there are some banks that uh, have made public policy statements and others that haven't. Well, uh, before anybody else asks you the question, I've always had this sneaking unhappy feeling yeah. about the World Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about them? Well, I, uh, I happen to be a member of it. Uh, my church is a member, first of all. It's, it's, what, 302 churches around the world with a broad spectrum, all the way from the Pentecostal Church in Brazil to the Church of Scotland. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a wide spectrum. Uh, I belong to two units of the World Council, the one on congregational renewal, which hardly anybody ever hears about. It has to do with the uh, prayer life of Christians, mm -hmm. the renewal of, of uh, uh, Christian life in the community. And I also belong to the human rights uh, unit. You know what I'm getting at. Remember the stories that used to be fed out, true or not, that uh, yep. money donated to World Council of Churches was used to buy guerrilla arms yep. and ammunition for slaughtering innocent people, right. albeit perhaps whites, right. in the old Rhodesia. Yep. Well, I think the, uh, the phrase you used is well taken. The stories are fed out. Uh, Some of them must have been true. Where the smoke, we always say. <laughs> The World Council works with partner churches, you know, with churches in South Africa. In this case, it happens to be the Evangelical Lutheran, the Presbyterian, the Congregational churches, who uh, are working with the, what, 18 million blacks, is it? Yeah, 26. 26 now, okay, to, to really um, fight for and get freedoms that we have taken for granted long since in this country, such as equality of education. And as you know, they're, they're fighting against a legislative system which has been put in place by four million whites. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a war to be a people. Uh, they struggled for, what, 40 years to try and, and get that situation changed peacefully, couldn't do it. And now, uh, ha regrettably, but uh, understandably, have gone to some, uh, some armed conflict. But our money, I guess I have to underline this, you know, our money goes for legal advocacy of people who have been the victims of racism, goes to the bush camps for their children. Not one penny of it goes to arms. Uh, some may be, may be diverted by who knows what, of course, and I wouldn't push you on that. But you have traveled mm. a fair amount of the world in your two years as a moderator. Mm -hmm. Where? Went to Thailand about a year ago to look at the refugee camps because our church has sponsored 600 refugee families coming to Canada. Then I spent six weeks in uh, Nicaragua, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina. And then in uh, September, was in India, Hong Kong, South Korea, Philippines, and Japan. And don't you come back with a dreadful feeling of hopelessness no, and helplessness? No, I don't. No, I come back with ex exactly the opposite. It's interesting because I spoke to one of our moderators who'd done the same kind of visitation 10 years ago, and he said, I came back with a terrible feeling of depression. And I said, well, I don't because, you know, the situation's changed. And now what we used to call the younger churches, churches the products of mission, if you like, right. are, have hold of their own lives and are doing some... Well, some very creative things. Brazil, I presume, is a dictatorship of some kind? It's a military, military regime. Argentine? Military regime, Chile the same. Nicaragua? Nicaragua is, well, as you know, they had a revolution in 79 to get rid of Somoza, who was the military dictator. Well, that's where the Sandinistas took Sandinista over. Sandinista socialist uh, regime. 
But how can one have any effect on these kind of repressive regimes, which will do as they will, like the Soviet Union or the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. when their survival is affected? I mean, well, I mean, the I'm, bottom line is, if yeah. you affect our security, we'll trample on you. That's right. That, so I share your disease there. I mean, I felt about Central America that uh, it's so fragile, it's so fragile, and their economy is, is very dependent on either the East or the West. In, so they're pawns. In just a minute, where was the place you got that little quilting thing? From uh, Chile, Chile, where uh, it's a very repressive regime. And um, the women down there do some very creative things with their stitchery. Uh, and you yeah. bought this in the market, did you? No, no, no. I brought it from the Roman Catholic women in something called the Vicary of Solidarity, which works for the human rights of people in Chile. Uh -huh. That is, people who have been imprisoned. All right, there it is there. All what does right. it represent? Well, on the left, it's, it's uh, on the top of the Andes Mountains, which you always see in Back Santiago. Back a little bit. Beautiful, beautiful mountains. Uh, it's the rich and the poor, which is the basic situation of that country. Oh, the, the rich are on the left of the screen with the motor cars and the fancy dress. And the trees and the purses and the big houses. The poor, uh, you see, there are many more of them, eh, on the right? And uh -huh. they have, you see that WC at the bottom? Right. Water closet, one toilet for the whole community, and one pump, one water. So and people... See the, mm. But see the people in between there, with mm. their hands up? Those are the military who keep the poor in their place. Uh, and this came from a Roman Catholic... Roman Catholic women, yeah. Who are well aware of the injustices which are happening to them. That's right, and the profits from that go to uh, support the rights of prisoners and the, their legal... Of their legal uh, rights. Don't you sometimes waking up in the morning and think that because of the power blocks in the world and the lack of influence of religion mm -hmm. of any kind mm -hmm. on military tactics that it's only a question of time until we blow ourselves apart? That's one of the possibilities that you know really is frightening now, particularly young people. I find them very much aware of this. You know, for the first time, the human race could annihilate itself. Uh, but I think for people of faith. <laughs> um, you know, our reading of the biblical history is that uh, the God of creation will always raise up a remnant. There will always be a recreation. So I found many of the people that we work with in these countries full of hope, although they're in the midst of desperate situations. In other words, we, we should count our blessings. Count our blessings and, uh, and believe that uh, we indeed are not the managers of the universe. But as uh, good Christians, should we also believe that if uh, nuclear annihilation comes, it's the will of God? Oh, no, for sure not. You know, I got asked a question about the morality of the church. It was in BC a couple of years ago. And uh, it was one of these don't you agree questions, of course, which I never do agree with. And it was don't you agree that the moral fiber of the United Church is at a low ebb? And I said, yeah, I do, because I don't know how many congregations are really putting top priority on the question of disarmament and nuclear annihilation which I think is a really key moral issue of our time. Like it's well, how do you tackle it? Well, we make What is your leadership? Which party should we vote for? Uh, well, I think it's an all-party thing. Like, it's got across the political spectrum. And we're finding the, a lot of support in the kind of inter-parliamentary committees who really look at, uh, at human needs and human issues, both on the nuclear issue. Well, there's a team right now in El Salvador, which is an all-party group. Mm -hmm. That happened also in terms of our inquiry into the uh, north-south, the, the gap between the rich yeah. and the poor. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for citizens, that seems to be one of the ways in which we can put pressure on the political systems of our country. What do you want the individual to do, though, when it comes to starving people in Salvador, Guatemala, or anywhere else? Be, Africa, be, aware, of the trade be aware of the trade policies of Canada, uh, which are very seldom linked to human rights issues, uh, and make representation to your MP. Uh, I think our own lifestyles involved too. Like how much, how much, how many things do we need? You know, how much affluence do we need? We're selfish. Yeah, and and it's come as the result of uh, economic systems which have been set in place by people. They're mm. not God's will. <laughs> you know, they can be changed. If you can believe it, you know, when I was in Rio de Janeiro, I saw the Flintstones on a TV set with with dub Portuguese soundtrack. Mm. I mean, it was obscene. Mm. Because it was coming into a shack, and yet the Flintstones, who are prehistoric, had an electric fridge, yeah. an electric, you know, the whole bit. And talk about rising expectations. You expect, uh, I mean, really? really, we can't avoid world disaster of some kind the way we're going now because there are no forces in the horizon to correct them. Well, that's right. And it's, it's out of control in a sense. And I think what's going to happen is it will force quite a radical change in our lifestyle and in the way things are going. We'll talk about Canadian lifestyle models, ethics and fiber after the break with Lois Wilson, the right Reverend Lois Wilson, moderator of the United Church of Canada.
the Right Reverend Lois Wilson is the first woman moderator in the history of the United Church. In how many moderators now? Um, 28. 28 moderators. Since 1925. Did it come as a shock to you? Uh, it came as a, as a surprise and a joy, and I found the church congratulated itself because it is the first time in our history that uh, a woman has been elected. Do, do women have complete recognition in the United Church in terms of pastorates or, or being ordained? Or is, is there still a fair uh, amount of resentment to a woman in the pulpit laying down the biblical <laughs> law on a Sunday morning? Well, we've ordained women since 1925, uh, so we've a long history. But uh, uh, I think that in the last, what, five years, we've had a great incursion of women so that one-third of our candidates for ministry, one-third of our candidates, that's high, are now female. And we don't know what the, uh, what the experience is going to be in terms of congregations inviting them. Many are married, so you know, it's a double career family, and, and we've got all those issues too. Like. But I think women bring some gifts to ministry that perhaps, well, they'll complement those of men. Like your husband is a minister. Yes, he's a minister. Well, did you both uh, teach in the same church? Yes, we've always shared the same church. Where? Well, in uh, Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, Hamilton, and now in Kingston. As I was saying before, you can you can split shifts. <laughs> well, actually, we didn't tend to do it that way. We said to ourselves, you know, it developed out of our marriage, of course. We happened to be complementary personalities and complementary gifts. So he would do most of the nurture of the congregation, and I tended to do helping the congregation do ministry in the community. Yes. So I would visit people on the job, you know, at Great Lakes Paper or uh, in the TV studio or wherever they worked. Was that when you started this thing called Town Talk? <laughs> oh, you read about that. Yeah, tell me about Town yeah, Talk. Well, that was a very, uh, it was an attempt which turned out to be wildly successful, much to our surprise, in 67 in Thunder Bay to assist the whole city to really set the goals. What are the priorities of this city? And uh, it was the churches who, uh, set the scene who said let's do it and then invited everyone and uh, it uh, it had strong media support you made a remark earlier on about the problems of today's society did you were you referring to the breakup of marriage well I think that that's one way it's evidenced it's evidenced why has this happened the loss of meaning I mean, there's always been a loss of meaning yeah, but look at think all the of the stuff depression got, but look yeah. At all, yeah but we got the opposite thing which is all that rich uh, affluence you know there's nothing that we can't have many of us so where does when you got it all then what I don't know what about the future of the family when mother's working because she's got to work mm -hmm. to, to pay the 18 percent mortgage yes. and father's working and mother may be making more money than father yeah on the children in daycare can well, you honestly endorse motherhood here I go again the old, <laughs> oh, show, the old chauvinist motherhood where the children are lovingly produced and put out to be cared for by somebody who doesn't know them all through their form formative years from six months up. Can well, you endorse this? Um, well, what I'd have to say is that, uh, you know, I fully support the changing roles of men and women. But I think as women move into uh, uh, that kind of uh, function, then men also have to change their role. They but can't men can't have babies. Well, I know that. You haven't got the architecture, but still, the point is that the roles can be shared. The parenting roles need to be shared. And so many men in the past, it seems to me, have been completely absent from the nurturing role of, of families. And because women's role is changing, it means that men can maybe shift and share some of that. Now, um, I think that we're also experiencing uh, different styles of what a family is. It isn't necessarily just the, you know, the mother and the father and the two children. Who is it then? Well, a man came up to me and he said, I'm really enjoying the new family. I'm a widower. Mm -hmm. I, I live now with two university students and we have become a family and this is our new constellation. And we have a covenant. We're going to live together. So no. good for him. Good for you don't him. mean a man has a trois or something to No, no, no. Well, I know, mean, but nowadays, you know, this permissiveness. You're meaning the sexual overtone. Yes. Oh, well, I mean, the. Our society is so hung up in that area. No, I'm meaning what it means to be a full person and to know how to love each other without genital sex. Well, that has never changed. Well, uh, many people don't know how to enter into a loving, caring relationship with other people, which is what a family is all about. Back to my problem, though. Back to not my problem. I'm old and square and got grandchildren <laughs> by the thousand. I've got one. All right, but I'm older than you are. Back to this business. <laughs> That because of the economic necessity, it's absolutely vital for the woman to have her own career and a well-paid career. 
and there's, I can have no objection to entering the men's field, but what does that do to the family grouping and the family down the road? It breaks it apart so long as the man is not willing to look at the changed situation. No, no, it's dodging the question. Without the mother's care in the formative years because of economic necessity, can you have that family closeness? which you had in the old, perhaps, downtrodden days mm -hmm. where the woman may, may have been the boss, but she stayed at home. Can All you right. have the family love and the family grouping? I think you can. I think that there needs to be a constant, uh, uh, you know, steadfast love for infants and children because that's their emotional well-being established. I think that there can be various ways of doing that. Uh, it can be the man or the woman. It can be, it can be other supports, but it has to be the same the same person, it can't be a variety. Well, does the church, generally speaking, now close its eyes to the whole new sexual mores of our society and say, ah, abortion's fine, mm. homosexuality is fine, whatever mm. is fine. Mm -hmm. None of that matters as long as you worship God. Is that the no. attitude of the church? No, it isn't at all. And that's why I mentioned earlier that the, I think what the church can do is lift up some very good alternative models of sexuality which have not to do with the kind of stuff you read about in magazines, you know, which uh, I think You mean a happy married couple? And a loving, caring relationship between people. Like, what does it mean to love is, is one of the key questions. But the church would also support daycare centers for the support of children, for the support of the social fabric, which we don't have hardly anywhere in this country. Not enough of, anyway. That's right. All right, when you look at the state of the economy today, mm -hmm. what do you predict? Oh, I'm no prophet in that area. But can you see, can you see because of the expectations of affluence which have been achieved by many, not by all, because a vast proportion of our people live under the, prop, the um, what's the word, poverty line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see our kind of democracy and our kind of church going, just being withered away in a little bit of social anarchy down the road? Well, a lot of people are suffering. I'm thinking particularly of widows, women over 65 who are on fixed pensions. Or over who 60 are really who can't get the full pension. Yeah, that's right, and they've got five years to bridge, that's right. and they are below the poverty line. And they're very, you know, very often ignored, I think, in, uh, in our society, and are needing supports, both financial and otherwise. Women's issue, uh, women. Are women yet getting anything like a fair deal? I mean, I've seen a vast change. Do you think the woman has reached a plateau of, quote, liberation? Of, well, uh, as you say, there has been a vast change, but I think uh, there's a long, long way to go. A long, long way. Well, we're not speaking just of, of equality. I mean, the church's concern here is, is equality, but beyond that, um, the feminist movement, for example, within the Christian church is, is a new way of looking at reality, which is not in a hierarchical kind of uh, model, but more a circle. And I suppose you're the leader of the feminist movement. No, I'm not. I, no, I'm not. You are a feminist. Uh, yes, I, uh, but I'm not the leader by a long shot. But uh, I support and have learned from the feminists. Well, as a Christian, of course, you're happy that everything will turn out all right in the end. <laughs> hmm? oh, that's a rather broad statement. What do you mean everything will <laughs> turn, turn out? all right in the end. <laughs> well, I'm kind of depressed these days. Well, I think we're going down a slippery road to a touch of anarchy and a lot of industrial trouble where we'll all turn inwards and be very selfish. Well, I think that our society is in deep trouble, both in terms of its values. You know, you take the seven deadly sins of the Middle Ages, and we've made those virtues. Well, can you repeat well, the seven deadly well, sins? Well, greed and avarice. Oh, yes. Yeah, first right. thing we say is how much, how much you're right. worth, you know, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're not getting a, you know. Uh, lust, mm -hmm. that's a virtue in our society by many. Uh, sloth, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the leisure. Oh, yeah, that's a virtue. <laughs> Uh, gluttony? We're all on diets? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> Go on. I mean, those are some of them. And it just seems to me that in the, in the whole value system of our society, that may be one of the things which Christians have to bring Is to a renewal yeah. of our society. But uh, we're in deep trouble. Very well put, right, Reverend Dr. Wilson. Questions and calls to Dr. Wilson. Sharp, sharp, succinct, and on the point. After the break. I'm a little annoyed at you, right, Reverend Dr. Wilson. Why? How long have you been moderator? 
Uh, since uh, August of 80. When do you finish? August of 82. Uh, and it's the first time we've had a chance to get <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm enjoying it anyway. Why are you here just now? Well, I came because of the Royal Council of Churches Assembly in Vancouver in 1983 to do some work with the church community here in uh, assisting them to understand what it means to be a host and hostess when the whole world comes. Well, you were here at Habitat. Yes, I was, 76. Yeah, that was quite a thing. That was marvelous. The question I forgot to ask you. It's a very practical question. How are ministers doing on wages, on stipends? Uh, depends which church you're speaking about. Um, In other words, it depends on the, the resources the of the local congregation. Yes, and the particular denomination. Yeah. But you wouldn't say that ministers are overpaid or catching up with the cost no, of living. No, but I wouldn't say they're starving either. Not like the old days? No. Go ahead to Dr. Wilson. Hello, where are you? Oh, Dr. Wilson? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, nuclear holocaust. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, if God created man and man created nuclear bombs, then did God create nuclear bombs? <laughs> um, I guess I'm not able to answer yes or no. What I'd like to, how I'd like to reply is by saying in our kind of world, we, we face very tough moral decisions about the responsible use of technology, whatever that technology is, and the nuclear technology is the, is the toughest decision. But there's all other kinds of technology which are sometimes used to oppress people and dominate them, rather than to give them that life which we read about in the Gospels, which is called abundant. So uh, I don't think you can lay, you can't blame God for the discovery of nuclear technology. It is, it is people that have done it. And uh, the church uh, hopefully will not oppose you know, the scientific inquiry, but the church does raise the moral questions about how the fruits of scientific inquiry are to be used responsibly for people. Are you saying that man has a free will? Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, does, does God decide what our choices are in a free will? No. We do? We do with an understanding of God's purposes for us. That's a good answer. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, sir. Yes, hello. Um, Dr. Wilson, I'd just like to comment on your remarks this morning about role, um, role changes, mm -hmm. uh, changing roles for men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree uh, totally with you and would just like to say that one of the most important experiences in my own life was um, having to take over the, the care and nurturing of two young children mm -hmm. um, because I was in school, my wife was working, etc. Uh, I raised them from six months until five, six years. Um, almost exclusively, and that it opened up in me capacities for love that mm -hmm. nothing else um, possibly could have, and that it, it has improved the quality of my relationships in every every aspect. So, and you know, I'm I sympathize, I sympathize with with Jack's fears, but I think that the transition is not that difficult, and that and that that old-fashioned kind of loving home is in fact an ideal, but that it is really too much work for one person mm -hmm. uh, to be allocated, a woman, and that that ideal can be reached by two people pulling together. Well, I'm really glad to hear you say that because uh, as women have traditionally known that role, and I treasure it, I have four children, which I would not have missed for anything, but uh, I also enjoy what I'm doing now, so there is a sense in which we need to rearrange the way life works. Yes, I, I think the old-fashioned values are good, and but it's just a question of sharing that load. Yes. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. Uh, um, I'm calling from Pitt Meadows here, uh, Dr. Wilson. Yes. Uh, these uh, questions I have are actually quite trivia. It's just, uh, I'm at night at church, uh, I guess, uh, when I joined the Navy, I was, and I guess I still am. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm a little confused here to this respect. Now, you're Dr. Wilson. Yeah. Yes. And you're also a right reverend. Yes. Right. And I don't understand that. The well, reader I can sort of handle. It, it, it's not all that important. I'll shut up now, and I'll turn the TV up, and I'd like you to sort of explain that to me. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's actually quite okay, good. Okay, yes. I answer to many things. Uh, right Reverend is the title, I suppose, the, which goes along with moderator, uh, which is the office I hold for two years. The doctor is purely honorary. It was given to me by a university. And my father used to say, you know, if, you get a, if you're called doctor in the church with an honorary degree, uh, it uh, doesn't give any more pig, it just gives a little curl on the tail. <laughs> uh, I also answer to Mrs. Wilson, 
to Reverend Wilson, which is uh, the ministerial designation, and also to Grandma Wilson. So I answered to many things. I also answered to Lois, which is my Christian name. <laughs> Nicely done. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, sir. Yes, I'd just like to make a comment that I believe that the human problem for survival is based on uh, one of power versus wisdom. Hmm. That uh, if you compare the Roman Empire to now, mm -hmm. they w might have had approximately one millionth the capacity of destruction. However, uh, perhaps uh, only one tenth the civilization. And so that uh, it doesn't matter how powerful human beings become in the future, whether we can cast galaxies across the heavens, we still will take the enemy with us. And it just may be the failure of the human race in, in this capacity, in its evolution, like any other species. Mm -hmm. The question is, still, in the face of the universe, this may yet be no more myth than the dodo bird going extinct or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. End of question, or end of comment. End of comment, end of question. Are oh. we dodo birds? <laughs> Are we naked apes, hell-bent for self-destruction? I think not. We're human beings, and I happen to believe that we're created um, within the love and purposes of God, and uh, so we hopefully uh, order our lives and our decisions within that understanding. That was a good question there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead, please. Me? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, religion has to play a very important part in uh, sl any solutions to our world problems. But I'd like her to tell me how a religion that was concocted uh, several thousand years ago and that is totally inconsistent with our present day knowledge is going to be given any credence by uh, mm -hmm. people who uh, are intelligent enough to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess I'd have to disagree. I don't think religion was concocted. Uh, it came out of people's historical situation, their particular life experiences. And that indeed is the whole, is the history of... Well, of the life experiences of the people several thousand years ago were radically different from ours. Uh, uh, I don't want to disagree with you on your semantics, yeah. but uh, the religion did mm -hmm. originate several thousand years ago mm -hmm. when people didn't know what caused disease or what caused weather or what uh -huh. caused babies or uh -huh. they were totally ignorant of yep. uh, most of the things that are common knowledge yes. today. Yes. And the conclusions they came to were totally inconsistent with our present day knowledge. So how can anyone, uh, it's an intellectual insult really. Uh. So how can anyone uh, pay any uh, particular attention to them? I'd like to say, you know, I'd like to see Christianity do some great good and uh, solve our problems, but I don't see any hope for it unless it revises its dogma to, uh, uh, to come in line with our present day knowledge. Well, you'd be happy to know, sir, that its dogma is rapidly being revised, and there are many of us who are working very... They're going to accept revolution, or okay. evolution. Okay, just a minute. I'm sorry? When are, we, when are they going to acknowledge re evolution? Well, um, my particular branch of the Christian Church has always acknowledged evolution, and there sees no conflict. Um, the churches have also been instrumental in this country, for example, in the... Uh, and you don't say God created Earth in six days? I think that God created the world, whether it's six days or six centuries, well, the universe. is really slightly irrelevant. Carry on with your thesis, though. You were saying... That, that the churches in this country were the ones who started the school system, who started the hospitals and the healthcare delivery system, so that I find it hard when you say that there's been, uh, you know, a contradiction there. On the other hand, I, I have to... I pay attention to them when, they, uh, when they're, they're, uh, they're preaching a dogma that's, uh, that's way yeah. out of date okay. for knowledge. Well, I must agree. If that is indeed how you perceive it, then uh, I guess I'd urge you to uh, try... How I perceive it. Try and put yourself in, in touch with some Christians who, uh, I've been in touch who with are not doing life. that. Okay, it's quite good though. <laughs> His point is, is, is quite sharp yeah. in that dogma changes, but regardless of the origins of man and whatnot, mm. you feel that we're blessed with the spirit of the Lord. Well, I would distinguish between dogma and the life of faith. You see, the life of faith has to do with commitment. It's like learning how to swim. Whereas the dogma is way out here. It's, it's like these crazy polls you hear in the newspaper where 98% of the people believe in God. Well, so what? What kind of a God is it in whom they believe? Is it a God who's going to, who's going to act, who has been active in history? But and, you uh, believe in God because of your faith. Which is risk, which is trust, which is uh, like walking across somebody's shoulders who's on a guy line across Niagara Falls. I mean, you take the risk of falling in, eh? That's what it has to do with. Lois Wilson, Right Reverend Lois Wilson, moderator of the United Church of Canada. You've been a delight. Thank you. I've enjoyed speaking with you. My thanks. Next, we're going to talk to the guy from the Letter Carriers Union about this allegation of nepotism. My thanks to Lois Wilson. I'll be back after the break.
do you think of it all, fellas? What do you think of it? Not very good. Not very much, anyways, I'll tell you that. It's a pits. I've done nothing wrong. Uh, they, by law, I guess, by the way it's been presented, I've broken the law. I'll have to pay the penalty. In my mind, I know that I have done nothing wrong. I have with me now, at short notice, Emil Lehingrat, who is president of Local 12 of the Letter Carriers Union of Canada. Thank you for coming out, uh, My pleasure, Jack. Mr. Lehingrat. It's just that when I saw the story on the wire this morning, I thought, I've got to speak to my friends in the posties. It says here that your new agreement smacks of nepotism and that it, appear, it gives relatives the first crack at vacation jobs when your people go on holiday because we have a new four-week vacation plan. Is this correct? When I read this this morning, Jack, I was appalled. It makes it sound as if we're going to have 1,250 letter carriers off on vacation during the months of July and August, right. and certainly that isn't the case. The new collective agreement uh, affords us four weeks vacation after eight years, mm -hmm. uh, five weeks vacation after 20 years, and so forth. Six weeks after 30 and seven after 35. Right. And this is covered under normal circumstances by what we call vacation relief people, right. letter carriers. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, the ratio is based on one in 13. Mm -hmm. So there are approximately 75, between 75 and 80 people going on vacation at a given time. We're but talking about uh, Vancouver? In what? Vancouver. Right. Vancouver uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that will not change. Now, I can't understand how uh, w this would add to what we have at the moment. This will not change. The same ratio will be going on vacation at the same time. Yeah, but the point I'm making, Emil, is that it seems to be that you have a memorandum of understanding, not part of the agreement, which gives preferential hiring to relatives of members of the Letter Carriers Union. Is that correct? Well, I don't, I, this has not been confirmed as far as I'm concerned at this point in time. Uh, there, I have heard rumors that that is so. But if I were the son or a daughter of a letter carrier looking for summer work, I would, and I wanted permanent work, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be looking at this for the simple reason that this only would be on a piecemeal basis. In other words, if a person uh, did not uh, show up to uh, cover that person on vacation, then there might be a week's work here or there. But it certainly would not be permanent summer employment. I don't quite understand it, though. It would, Andrus says, according to the province study, which may or may not be correct, that the memorandum of understanding is not part of an agreement, but that this memorandum of understanding gives the first pick to relatives of posties. Now, before this thing here, has that been the case up to no, now? It never has been, and I don't see it being either because there is just no work there. It's all, the, the work is already covered. But so you, you can't tell me, though, if there is a provision in this memo. Have you seen this memorandum of understanding? No, I have not. Could it be in this memo of understanding? It's possible, yes. If it's in the memo of understanding, do you think it's right? No, I don't think it's right. That's what I wanted to get from you. I don't think it's right. I don't believe that there should be preferential treatment given to anyone. Now, the present practice is that people are hired off the street and are required to pass an entrance exam, et cetera, then they have, to, uh, they have to qualify for the job, and then they become employees of the post office. As president of Local 12 of the LCUC, therefore, you didn't take part in any bargaining or negotiating in which anyone asked for first pick for job for Postie's relative? No. Could be there, though. It's possible. Do you have a sneaking suspicion it is there? If it is there, I'd ca uh, I can't see how it will be uh, used, because there's really no extra work uh, created during the summer months. In other words, 75 to 80 people who, and casuals would be used for that? No, no, these are permanent pl employees that cover the vacation relief. Oh, you've got 75 to 80 that cover the vacation That's relief. That's right, so I can't see how they can add to that or take away from that. Where do you think this story came from then? Oh, good Lord, who knows? Do me a favor, Emil. When you get to the bottom of it, will you let me know? I certainly will. But your position is that if there is any such memo of understanding not in the agreement, which appears to give relatives of any government employee first pick at the job, you'll object to it? Certainly. I think we should have uh, fair treatment for all. And I know that nepotism, as stated in that article, goes on 
uh, all around us. All around us, in all many places. Us. It's and not who you know, not what you know, it's who you know. I have, and I can give you an example. My son has been trying to, he's uh, going to university, been trying to get work at uh, one of the corner supermarket stocking shelves. He doesn't know anybody there, he doesn't get a job. Yeah. So, you know. They have very well paid jobs under a very good union agreement, and obviously, if there's a fiddle, it's going to be a fiddle of somebody who's in the place right now. Certainly, I would not discourage any of our members, sons and daughters, from applying at the post office for summer employment. But I, uh, under this memorandum of, of understanding, if there is one, I can't for the life of me see how there would be work created there. I get your point. Emil Lehingard, it's very good of you to come and be so frank with me. And I know that when you eventually get hold of this thing, perhaps you could spell it out to me and let me see the copy of the Memorandum of Understanding. I'll give you a call, Jack. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Very Just welcome. wait there for a minute. Next, Frank Howard, NDP. Haven't spoken to Frank in years. Oh, yes, one day when he had a car to punch up with somebody in the Victoria. But he's a man of strong opinions. After the break. Frank Howard and I are old combatants from the days when he was a very outspoken member in the House of Commons in Iowa. And just as you get older, you know, you get a little senile at times. But I always remember the magnificent battle, I hope I've got the right story, that you put on with a colleague of yours to smash and destroy the Quebec system of divorce and to force our modern divorce system in Canada. Am I right in my memory? Oh, that, absolute, absolute. How many years ago is that, Frank? Oh, that was in the part of the Diefenbaker era, in 60, 61, 62, and into the time when Pearson became the Prime Minister. Who was your colleague at the time? Arnold Peters. Arnold Peters. From Tomiskaming in Northern and, Ontario. And what was your battle, to be precise? Well, Parliament used to go through this silly, stupid process of divorcing people in Quebec and Newfoundland, because Quebec and Newfoundland didn't have their own divorce courts. You know, so they used to come to Parliament and we pass a bill. Go through three readings in the House, three readings in the Senate, and we determined that that was just absolutely stupid waste of time of MPs. So we conceived the idea of filibustering. And if we could build up a backlog of cases on divorced people seeking to be divorced, tough as it was on them, that that pressure would result in some political decision being made to get them out of the legislature. So I'm Mr. So-and-so from Montreal. And I have legit, I want to get rid of my wife. Or my wife wants to get rid of me, me and vice versa. They had to present a petition to Parliament That's in right. the form of a bill of the House of Commons exactly. of Canada. Exactly. <coughs> and would that bill spell out the salacious details? No, it would just say that the marriage between so and so and so and so is null and void. That's the end of that. All of the details. All First of the reading. Second reading. Committee stage. Committee stage. <laughs> That's in the Senate. And then it would come over to the House of Commons. We'd do the same thing. Hundreds of divorces a year. Yes, yes, we used to, uh, yes, we, we had built up a backlog of, I've forgotten the number, but it was something in the neighborhood of 1,500 unresolved divorce cases when finally it, uh, it worked. And, and finally you put enough pressure on that the, the legal beagles had to catch up with the morality of the country and bring in a proper divorce code for the whole of the nation. The more important, yeah, the more important aspect of that, I think, Jack, was not so much the filibuster about the individual divorce cases, but what it was the larger question of adultery being the only grounds for divorce and the foundation of changing the whole divorce concept as to what can be the grounds for divorce to catch up with reality. Well, that, that was a practical demonstration of the use of house rules to achieve a legitimate object. Well, we felt so. Right now, when you look at the House of Victoria and you are the House le Leader, do you have the same kind of freedom of uh, movement and tactics under Bennett that you would have in the House of Commons? Well, the rules are different. The procedures are somewhat different. Each legislature develops its own. Eh? But we don't have uh, that process of a certain length of time set aside for private bill legislation. Uh, uh, there are certain days set aside for that in which it will come after government business. But the rules are, are, are much different. Well, much uh, different. Not we can, comparable. We can always do with a little less than how the House works. But I remember the famous battle. You came back in what, 79? In 79, Jack, yeah. Uh, not a dime without debate. Not a dime without debate. And yet, to a common sense observer, if there is one, on the outside of the legislature, it would seem to me that a timed stricture on a debate is not a bad thing. That's right, it isn't. 
Do we have that in the House? No. See that? Well, only on individual debates, only on the limitation of the amount of time that I, as one individual member, can take in debating a specific matter. Um, no time limit on the Premier, for instance. Uh -huh. um, but, but there is, when we were the government in 72 to 75, we put into effect a time limitation on the length of time that the legislature could take in examining the estimates of expenditure. That was right. Yeah, that was what I thought it was. Sure, yeah. I think it was 135 hours of time consumed. When the Socreds came into office, they took that off. They said they didn't want any such limitation. Yeah. You know, so it's wide open, and you spend the time that uh, is hour available. after hour after hour after hour. Yeah, sometimes senselessly, but no, I'm I'm very very partial to uh, uh, to time limitations, agreeable and, and by agreement, not imposed. You know, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't accept a situation in which one person, say the Premier, comes along and says, you're going to confine yourself to this or that in length of time. For instance, work it out in an agreeable way. For instance, right now, to be topical on the, on the point, we had the performance by Premier Bennett on television mm -hmm. in which he promises, I mean, no doubt about it, promises a wage control bill for public sector employees. Mm -hmm. Would you accept a time limitation on that debate? Every debate in the legislature, every bill in the legislature, should be available to have a time limitation put on it. Yes. I mean, in a common right. sense matter. And yeah, right, exactly. And the, the, prime, the prime Premier and the opposition leader are the whips. Who agrees? Well, basically, I think in a situation like this where we don't have anything spelled out in our, in our rules, you've got to approach that the same way as they did in Britain, same way as they did in the House of Commons in Ottawa, and that's by a, a, a parliamentary device of a committee or the government house leader and the opposition house leader sitting down and working out an agreeable course of action, mm -hmm. not by imposition. In well, fact, in this province, Jack, we've got far, far too much of authoritarian, dictatorial decisions imposed by the Premier. And that's yeah. not good. That's certainly not good. But as you and I well know, eh, under the British Commonwealth and the British Canadian system of uh, parliamentary de democracy, a Premier with a clear majority can be a dictator. Well, look, uh, I look at Premier Bennett and I look at Prime Minister Trudeau, and in terms of their attitude towards democracy, I don't see any difference. But I'm That's giving right. you a broader question. That's that if, right. if it's an NDP Premier with a majority, in effect, in the final analysis, basically, basically his will right. runs true. Yes, that's true. It depends what is the propensity and tendency of the individual who holds that office. And if you have a person in the, in the, in the Premier who has a tendency to lean towards the dictatorial aspect mm -hmm. of our, of our uh, order, then that's what you get. If you have a Premier who leans towards participatory activity with people and paying attention to democracy in its, in its full sense, then you get a different orientation. I think you can narrow yeah. even more than that. I think it depends on the caliber of the cabinet who have daily contact with the Premier. Well, it depends on the Premier, too. You know, all right, the caliber of the cabinet says this. If you have a Premier who has an authoritarian bent to his nature, and then if you have some heavies in the cabinet, as we've got in this cabinet, uh, you know, uh, the people with a lot of clout, uh, people like Bob McClellan, who brooks no interference from anybody, uh, people like Don Phillips, you know, who, and, and, then, and then weaklings like poor Peter Heinemann, you know, who got no clout at all, then of course all he's they do... He's very smooth and sophisticated. Well, he's smooth and sophisticated. He's a legal, legal of the worst sort. He's dangerous. Okay, Just because he's smooth. Okay, you know? let's have some fun. We don't often do this kind no, of no, thing. Go back, go back to this. You get, you get guys who are heavies in cabinet and a premier who leans in that direction, then you're going to get dictatorship. Okay. Yeah. Give me stars for clout. First star goes to Premier Ben. I think I'd give him a star for aloofness from the whole process and a, and a kind of a belligerence. But he is, he's the clout. He's the Premier. Who is the next toughest cabinet minister? With clout. Who brooks no interference? McClellan? Well, it, it, it was Mrs. McCarthy because she kind of slipped down the ladder somewhat uh, recently. Yeah. But it was her. You know, these, these, are, these move up and down. So then we've got McClellan, we've got Phillips. Yeah, those are two. Uh, Curtis. Now, Curtis primarily because uh, of his deputy minister, Larry Bell, and finance, the finance control, and the consolidation of authority in Treasury Board, which Curtis runs, and in, under the Financial Administration Act, which we passed at the last session, which gives him almost, you know, in, in 
dictatorial authority over the whole range of government activities in finance. In other words, the 12% uh, uh, top limit on government spending, more or less, will be done under the Financial Administration Act by Curtis and Bell. Well, not under the Financial Administration Act. That, that's, that's for administration purposes. That's not for budgetary development purposes. That's after you have the budget, then you've got, you've got the authority under that Financial Administration Act, Jack, that gives the Minister of the Finance the right to go out to a Crown Corporation that has excess money. And take it. Take it. And say, I'll pay you 4%. Crown Corporation can say, but I could put that in the bank in a term deposit and earn 16. I don't care. Give it to me and I'll lend you four. And I, Curtis, will put it in the bank and earn 16 and I'll keep the 12 and then I'll give it back to you when you need it. That's the authority that exists under that Financial Administration Act. Have you, can you document that with a, an example? I think it's Section 59. The Act is there. It was just passed last year. He has not done this. But he has the authority. It has the authority and the power they to do They can rob it. the Crown Corporations. Well, Rob, in quotes. Uh, yes. And use the money for general revenue or courtesies of advantage. Well, not, uh, not the money necessarily, but use the interest that that money might earn. The difference between what they'd be prepared to pay and what yeah, they'd be These are the, the kind of things about which we do not know enough. After yeah. the break. As House Leader of the NDP, uh, Frank Howard, I'm talking to, are you deeply concerned with all the procedural matters in the House? Oh, indeed, indeed. Um, that's the sum and substance of doing business in a democracy, are the, you know, the rules and the procedure and the way you conduct yourself and the way you get to the core of a question, certainly. Well, back to the Financial Administration Act. As I understand it, there is new authority last year for Curtis as Minister of Finance to take surplus revenues from crown corporations, pay them a nominal percentage, and invest it for the government's benefit. Now, what's bad about that? The money that a crown corporation has, crown corporation is there is to serve our interests, yours, mine, and everybody in this province. Eh? If the crown corporation accumulates funds, as it will from time to time, and puts that in term deposits and earns interest on it, then we should get the result of that earned interest in either better service or lower cost for those services. Mm -hmm. But if that excess is going to be soaked up over here and put into general revenue, then we end up paying excessively for the services of the Crown Corporation. We inhibit the actual regular orderly operation of the I Crown think Corporation. the most shameful scam pulled on us recently was the trebling of the water lease price oh, in the dams by which they collect 18 percent in our hydro bills and Curtis or somebody whips a hundred million dollars out the back door. Exactly. And that exactly. cost them nothing, not a single cent right. except the paperwork. That's all. That's all. That will, that will cost you and me a hundred million dollars extra this year. But there's one good, to one good thing about Bennett's uh, proposed law, you must confess, you know what I'm aiming at, Frank. He's going to roll back your 11.9% increase in MLA's salaries. Now, you must endorse that, surely. I've got no disagreement with him doing the, proposing that. It's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. Plus the fact when you looked, look at the last day of the last session of the legislature in July of last year, when he brought that in to establish it at that 100% of the, of the average wage level. So, you know, he said, let's have it in July. Now he says, let's take it back. One thing you should never do is play political games with the incomes of people. We've argued in the NDP for a long, long period of time that in dealing with salaries and incomes of MLAs and of MPs, that you do it through some outside body. A public body that looks at it and says, okay, uh, here, here's what it is, and it establishes what it is. That we don't then get into the stupid position of adjusting up and adjusting down to suit some political convenience. Except mind you in Ottawa and in BC too. You've got a cola business now in BC, haven't you? A what? A cola. kind of cola. Well, that's what this 11% is. Yeah, a cola. Well, it's not related to the cost of living. It's related to the average industrial wage in Canada. So it's in a, you know, you could call it cola. I just remembered what we were going to talk about this morning before I got distracted. <laughs> you, you've been a long time observer of the prison system. I get the feeling that the whole thing is crumbling. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. What would you do if you had your brothers? How could you, with a magic wand, kind of reshape? I don't know if you could do it with a magic wand, Jack. But you, you need could, a magic but wand. But you could do it with a club. Right. Right. We've 
who's interested in prisons, eh? Who's interested in the guy in jail? He is, or she is, their family, and a few crackpots like me, right. you know, who got some general interest, and that's it. The general public just doesn't give a hoot, okay? Unless there is a riot, as there was out, at, uh, out in the valley here, unless there is a situation. And then as soon as that fades from the headlines, well, then we're back not paying attention to it. What we've done in our prison system is this. Because of the lack of interest on the part of the general public, and because of the tendency towards some esoteric attitude, you know, on the part of the administrators, we have turned our prison system over to social scientists. We've turned it over to psychiatrists, this is at the adult level, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, you know, we're having a field day. There, there really are. And the guy in jail, the fellow or the woman in, in, in a, you know, say in a federal prison system, that's a great game. It breaks the monotony. I'm going to go and see the psychiatrist, spend an hour chatting with him. It's a, it's a head game they're playing. It doesn't help a damn bit. And it squanders a fortune. You know? That's, I'd start at that level. You know? I would do everything I possibly could to assist, help, guide, show love and affection and concern to the young kid. The person, you know, the youngster who gets into grief. That's where we bend every effort possible. After a person, you know, if they make it out of that period, okay, fine, they're on their way. But if after a succession of criminal activities and you find that here's a third and a fourth time loser and so on, I'd say, that's tough, man. You've decided the route you're going to go. You want to lead a life of prison, then here it is. You know, what act, kind of prison? Just a simple, ordinary prison that keeps the guy locked up. Not brutalizes him. No. You know, nothing of that sort. Give him his television fed, set, and lock him up, give him exercise, Work. but not pour money, squander money down the, the drain on the social work rehabilitative we've got, counselor. We, we've got places, we've got prisons where it's a one on one situation, where there's one staff and one inmate. You're joking? I am not joking. That's a fact. You federal pan. Federal mostly, yes. I don't know the ratio, for argument's sake, of places like Ocala. Yeah. Uh, you know, or, or, or the Prince George Correctional Facility. I but think it's that's worse what, than that's that. What's, that's what's, whatever it is, that, that's what's part of the difficulty. A person in jail, a person who continues to say, you know, I'm going to lead a life of crime, I'm going to play this game, it's lots, lots of fun out there, I'm going to gamble that I won't get caught, etc., etc. You know, he enjoys the game. Prison holds no threat for him at all. When you nail him, would you go for parole on mandatory supervision or would you give them finite sharp sentences depends, from the judge which should be abided by. It, de it depends, on, depends on the crime. For instance, a crime like that, and, and, and I will have to be somewhat polite in describing it because we're in the homes of thousands of people mm. in this province. A crime or crimes committed by that Olson that we're talking about. I've, the 25 year business, I've, that's what the law says and when it was up I supported it. I maintain that in those premeditated crimes when the person is psychotic and gets an enjoyment out of, you know, out of murder and rape and buggery and all of those sorts of things, especially with young kids, that there shouldn't be any equivocation, there shouldn't be any authority on the part of the judge to, uh, to be discretional, that that sentence of life should be life absolute and that person should die and rot in a prison and never ever have the possibility of getting out. That kind of, that kind of penalty, I submit, would be you know, sufficient deterrent to the extent that uh, sentences are, uh, you know, are, are deterrents to, uh, to criminal behavior. Instead of having this of nonsense about possibility after 15 years, well, considered after 25 years, even though the sentence does in, if, in fact mean life plus a day, in effect 25 years down the road he'll be out. Well, that's a distinct possibility depending on the attitude of the parole board at that time. Yeah. Just, I don't even like to talk about it anymore. No, but anyway, John, I'm but, just... No, you know, I'm, got the point. After the break. <laughs> Frank Howard, NDP MP for Skeena. What was your federal writing? Skeena, the same name. The uh, same name. A uh, much smaller area now. You know, the other thing about this disgusting creature, Olson, just one, I'll make an observation, you can respond or not. I find it almost impossible to argue against capital punishment in the case of a premeditated mass murderer of children who is not insane. 
depends whether you look upon it as uh, reflecting revenge or the concept of deterrence, and that's what it falls on. I'm looking at revenge, I okay. suppose, then, as most people do. Then that's understandable. Yeah. Now, uh, the Charter of Rights. You were in the Federal House of Commons a long time. Are you worried about this Charter of Rights being in the hands of judges? I'm, I'm somewhat partial, Jack, to the... Maybe I'm old-fashioned in this regard, or maybe I've spent too much time tr involved in procedural matters and the history of the development of our parliamentary system in, in this country. I'd be much more partial to the establishment of rights by the old British common law structure in which you establish them by practice and custom and ingrain them in the culture of the people. Writing them down is fine and dandy, but that confines them. Mm -hmm. That narrows them to what those written words are. Now, this is just a kind of a sensitivity, you know, that I have. About well, that's what I feel about it myself, I funny. Know. Maybe it's because of our age group. Yeah, yeah. And not for any other reason, because I see down the road that we're going to get mired in the American system of legalistic business. The constable erred, let the prisoner go free, even if he's guilty. Well, that, that may well be. But I say, my, my partiality, my sensitivity is in that direction. You see, the hard won and rights that, that exist, uh, that we inherited under the British parliamentary system, were inherited as a result of a struggle of people against authority. Mm -hmm. And thus they became a part of, of that which you struggled for and which you gained and attained as much more valuable. This is a very pleasant, soft sell interview this morning. Really, Frank? <laughs> That's a piece of nonsense. We should be screaming at each other. No, 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 How no. How dare you oppose Bennett's wage controls, which are obviously a sane and sensible thing to do in a time of suffering economy, and why should these government servants get oh, yeah. increases when the IWA are up against the wall? You're getting apoplectic here. Now listen, I didn't, oppose Bennett. <laughs> I didn't oppose Bennett's wage controls. I haven't said anything about that. What, what I think he has done is completely and absolutely irrelevant to the fact of life that we have got 15, say, thousands of lumber workers out of work in this province. 27. This, whatever number it is, it's an in, immense number, you know. We are faced with a difficulty here economically that I don't remember in my history. He can't you don't fix have. it. He can't fix he it. He may not be able to fix Reagan it. Reagan can fix Just it. A, Reagan has fixed it all right. Bennett can't fix it, perhaps, but he can, he can become involved in trying to help rather than sit back and say, oh, I've nothing to do with me. Bennett should be involved right at this moment. The provincial government, they got the money for it under industry and small business development in establishing a relationship with, the, with Kofi, for argument's sake, the Council of Forest Industries to try to find offshore markets. Who's going to do that? Don Phillips? I don't, look, don't clutter this up with talking with personality. With, with, with personality. No, right. I'm you, talking you're, about you're the essence of the You're doing the old evasion bit. He's got only so many dollars in the pot, he's not going to borrow. He can't afford to give the BCGEU 20%. Jack, He's I'll tell gonna... you something, I'll tell you something. I'll make what? you a wager. Make me a wager. When Curtis comes in with his budget, we'll whenever that may be. Right, we you know, don't know yet. We will be able to predict about $600 million extra revenue in this coming fiscal year. $600 million extra revenue. Extra revenue over last year. You mean he's got it up his sleeve? No, it's coming in. Water rates, $100 million from you through hydro. Automatic quarterly increases in All right, gasoline last question. Tax. Is the house going to be a Barney this year with the wage controls? I hope we spend our time talking about the economy and what's necessary to get people back to work. Frank Howard, NDP. Skeena. Hello, Skeena. <laughs> After the break. Well, now, tomorrow morning I have a very special program about May Gutteridge of St. James Social Service in Vancouver. And uh, make sure you watch it. It's not often I do a positive program about one of my really good friends and effective people. At 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> The Right Reverend Lois Wilson on Czech TV at midnight precisely.
Meet Me Gut Range on Webster tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.